Okay. I set these up as low contrast, high contrast. So you can see what each color does with a certain color. So when you guys are painting and you want to get a, a, a certain kind of light, you don't always have to have a sharp, strong color to get that light. You can get an optical relationship between different tones of planes in the same color, or you can decide you want a shocking visual idea and you shoot up to the reds or the oranges and it will give you more of this, more action. But that action depends on the basic idea of your whole painting. So we're going to play with neutrals and color and form sliding across all these planes, moving them together. Now I do this about once every couple of years because when you get into color, most people tend to follow the commercial world, which is pure color. Pure color has a nice moment, but you have to reduce its relationships to get the biggest action on your surface. So you'll find out as painters that you'll do a lot of tonal work or, or play with neutrals against them and then use a little pure color for the excitement that it provides towards the end of the painting. So you have more control as you're working up. In September, I'm gonna do an acrylic painting, show you how to do that in paint. Now this is easier because you don't have to need a medium. All you gotta do is stick it up there and see what it does. And if it doesn't do anything, you don't care, you just cut it up and do another one. But you're getting an action of tension and space. I'm always working towards space, no matter how I play. So we'll watch it develop into an organized whole at some point, hopefully. Now, I'm gonna use the blacks and the whites basically as neutrals, and I'm gonna trim up some of the massive colors and interact with them. So we'll play with the interacting against white and the interacting against black. Black, you'll find immediately excites color. White tends to calm it down. So if you have a lot of action going on and you, you feel like you're losing control, you can just hatch in a little white or tint the color with white, slap it up there and it'll start to get stable. So you have more control of it towards the end of your piece. You don't want to think of the beginning of your painting as the end of your painting. You want to think of the painting as a development a, a process of developing from a very soft idea where you're watching what's happening on your surface and make your adjustments to the canvas and not to what you think you want. Because often you're playing against something that's real that isn't working on a two-dimensional surface and you're having trouble. So you get too much distance here, too little distance there, too much expansion in the center because you're, you're looking too long at your object and not looking at your studies. Now I try to train you guys to do drawings and then work from the drawing to a color drawing and everything you do comes from your drawing. So that you're slowly breaking the literal text. You're no longer worrying about that flower is not in the right place. No, it's what is the place on that surface. Now I'll, I'll start with this just to, just to be annoying. I got enough little pieces? Yeah, good. That sounds good to me. Now I tend not to... Isn't that nice? Don't you do that.
topped out with something flamboyant, black and neutral. Hey, William, you made it in. Good. So we'll give this a shape and let it work from the blue into the red. Working from this corner over on top. see what this action will do between the white paper which eventually will have to be be introduced into this at some point in order to get a sense of the whole so I'm always no matter what my surface is if I choose a white surface to put my color on that surface is going to come into the idea of the painting at some point and that includes the collage too. Run this across the blue. Everything that interacts starts to affect what's going on in the other part of the painting. Pretty spooky looking, I must say. Go, there we go. I don't like doing that, but I have no choice. Fold, let them jump. There we go. Now whatever you do, you try to get that action going over and under to control the movement of your painting. So everything is always shifting and moving. So if you do something here, you go all the way to the other end and you make an action down there uh, so that, that it's never isolated. tuck that in at the very end of it. Uh-uh, get on the white paper, Jack. Thank you very much. Okay. Forward. guy. Now each one of these colors is different tones so you have to pay a lot of attention because they're going to change optically. Okay, so I have a little touch except for the center and then the center has to have some sort of shift or movement in it to keep 
the idea of, of every color you throw up there or every neutral you throw up there has a repetition. You don't want it ever to be isolated just in two areas. So you play with it until you get it to function, hopefully. Of course, you never know. You know, sometimes it doesn't work. You know. Can be stubborn. Okay, so. Run across here, under there. Now, whenever I throw a color up, I keep working with it. I don't let it become isolated because if you do, you enter into your painting and all of a sudden you realize you got a section that's stronger than the rest. And there's no sense of action and movement against each other. So you want to play with whatever color you use to develop it little, small, large, as you move across the plane. So I'm working this way, over and under, all the way. Then, and, it, and also showing you that where the dark is, it changes the tone of the color. The color gets a little more interesting when the black hits it. I don't do the bottoms yet because I'm gonna shove things under there, so, hopefully. Now, let me play with this just a little bit. Let's get a little bit an annoying here. So as I slide things over and up and under, you feel a sense of action happening between all these massive colors, even though they're all different, high, high contrast, low contrast, to give you the identity of that and then we'll move it up towards the end. So as we play with the colors and bring the pure colors back up, we'll see how they interact with the black or the white, depending. Then it gets real crazy. Now you don't care too much about the end. What you care about is what you're finding out from point to point. Because there's some areas that are very close to what you're doing in your own painting and some areas that are totally, completely removed from that. And you may want to make a note for the future. Because you never know when you're going to change. I mean, I change my mind, you know, two or three times a day. Yeah. Okay, this is important because it has to slide under I'm on you, jackass. There we go. So now that black is traveling large to small as it flips and flies. The smaller it gets, the more action it has. The action is only within that area, but the rest of the painting is still expanding. That expansion is happening because the pure color is the largest and strongest element. As it gets reduced by the actions of the forms we place on it, everything changes, but you get to see what that color does. That's the reason you do collaging. You don't think, in other words, I never thought any of this out. I use it according to what my eye is telling me to have. Once I do that, I'm starting to build something that is very personal. At the same time, I'm struggling with the idea, if I use this palette, what is this palette going to give me? Paper is cheap compared to paint. This is pretty expensive, but not, the, not as expensive as a tube of paint. The paint that you lay on and the, the techniques that you have to use to build your painting is much more difficult and takes a lot more patience. A lot of you try to finish your painting before you start it. Bad process. Okay, now we're gonna interact. Um, oh, I forgot this little fella. Let me play with him a little bit. I got some pieces left. So I'll run this over here. And then, oh, hello, you little devil. Nice to see you. 
call this on top here. Okay, so now the black, and you see how the black fuses with the blue in the orange it pops. Because the black will always excite the color. So the massive area is still holding its own because it's so massive. That tells you something. If you're working in a spatial piece and you have a large area of, of say, of this kind of blue, and you've done your surface like that, you can use little areas and shifts and planes and still hold on to that blue. But this blue is gonna to have to come up onto this painting at some point or start to become shrunken and feel like pieces working towards it. So you make adjustments according to A, what you can afford, and B, what you have. Sometimes you just don't have it, so you make adjustments. Okay, here we go. Now I'm gonna work this way across, and we'll play with these little devils. <laughs> this gets interesting. Yeah, you can feel it. Yeah. yeah, you can feel it. It has a sensibility. The more you deal with the action of, of your forms and your colors interacting, the more you see it because you're looking for it. In other words, you're changing your memory about what a painting is. That's really what Hoffman really did. Hoffman's whole existence was breaking away from the 18th century idea and moving into a Cezanne idea, which was very modern. They call it like a, a friend of mine, I had a, a Zoom class and one of my students went to a modern art show and she said, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I said, well, yeah, because it's basically commercial. It's not really modern. Modern art is always based on the principles of Cezanne. He's the guy who developed the open door and began to find this action that we take very seriously to this day. And that first one is you don't paint everything you see and your reality is your surface. So whatever you do on that surface should have a relationship to each other so the viewer can at least begin to dance with it. If they don't want to, that's fine. You know, they can go to another music. You know. But I've seen some really interesting effects. Okay, here we go. This gets very, very interesting and very strange, I'm, I, I gotta tell you. This reminds me of that painting of the Japanese trees you were lecturing about last night. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been stealing from them for years. Yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna run it. To, I'm gonna start reducing this blue a little bit. Run this at this level here. So that you can see the effect of these two colors where they touch each other is not that interesting but where the color is hitting the blue in this area, the eye is a little more because there's a little more contrast. It's the contrast that's giving you the light. So you're getting the light from your painting and not from any other source. That's what a lot of people forget. In fact, one of the things that Hoffman said was very smart, I've stolen it for years. He says, when you're looking at nature, the light is from the sun hitting the plants, giving us the light. But in painting, it is the paint that gives you the light. So you have to adjust your relationships of tone and colors to each other as you're moving. And that gives you your sense of expansion and contraction because the light is gonna make you move, theoretically. So we'll play with this a little bit. We keep it moving. We don't isolate it. Oh, look at that. It's very stubborn, I must say. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, that's cute. Okay, here we go. Okay, now there's a very subtle shift where the color is going to its own color. All contrast stops. So, you keep that moving before you fix it. <laughs> very tricky stuff, man. I move this up here, under here. Slowly evolving. Changing its rhythm so it's not on a straight line. Keeping those actions isolated from the, each other but together as they move. Very tricky. Now I got to hit this in the black one, spooky stuff over here. Hey, watch it. Okay, here she goes. Things should get really strong now. See the difference? Kind of spooky stuff happening here. Get in there. See what's happening? Very little. You don't need a big, massive thing to get the eye to move. All you need is to get the action in the right place. Okay, now I slide this under here to keep this action in rhythm so it doesn't get too isolated. Thank you very much. There we go. Well, it's getting kind of interesting so far. Throw a little orange on that red and see what happens. So, to throw the purest color on top, you start to see the relationship of this area to this area to this area. So you keep the, the eye constantly shifting and moving quiet to action to quiet to action. So you don't have to have a big quiet zone. Of course, it didn't hurt, but you don't have to. Now. Let me see what we got to do here. Oh, yeah. Now we get serious. Yeah. See, what I did is I set it up so that you could see automatically what happened between color against color. Then I started the action of form and motion so that you guys, step by step, could see what happens with the basic color, what that basic color does, how it affects the action that you put with it. So it's not just doing a nice collage. You're starting to learn 
that everything you do, every decision you make, has a relationship to what's happening on that surface. So you can know when to scrub out and repaint. So even though it's in four segmented panels, yep. you're still thinking of it as one unit? One hole. That blue is, if you notice, I'm pretty clever. I put the two warms in the center and the two cools at both end. So it's easy to interact. Then I took these colors and made sure that they were on the action of the two blues so that all the colors are moving to a different position. The, the moving the color to a different position gives you a huge advantage. If they're all sitting on the same line, they're boring. Like, I don't know how many times I've gone around and look at you guys work and you do this. I said, what the hell are you doing, making fences out of roses? So you I said, jerk them apart, get an action. But make sure that that action is not going to interrupt or become isolated from the rest of the piece. In other words, I don't want this action too much at the bottom of my paint. I want my bottom to be as quiet as I can get it to keep it moving up. So I do that all the time. The white paper here is literally making this quieter, even though we're going to throw some color down there eventually, with any luck, you know. And we're going to get into some really puzzling things here. Okay, now I'm going to put the, put the red through here on top here to interact with the blue, see what happens. We don't know. One thing happens, you know. We just don't know. Come on. not going to work, is it? Mm -hmm. There we are. Beginning to unify. Pretty simple stuff, yeah. Now, the meaning of an abstraction always changes because you're not literal. So the action is always the action of the color and the sense of, that it has on you at the time you're looking at it. That's why not everybody sees abstraction the same way twice. Okay, things are getting a little crazy. Go ahead. So you, can, you can actually create the flow of the composition. Yes. By moving the color the way you want to across. That's right. And changing its size all the time. Also, you're always changing its action. In other words, you don't want to have everything going this way and that way all the time. So every once in a while, you want to do this. It's like the, the roll of a wave hitting a rock. You want to get that shift, that rhythm. Once you get that rhythm, everything changes. Even your sensibility changes. Now you can do that, uh, you do it with a mist. You have the beautiful mountain doing this and then the mist running across and lowering the contrast 
between the top, the middle, and the bottom. It's a beautiful painting. You don't have to have a sharp painting like this, but we wouldn't learn much about color if I didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, the blue was there, and the blue was there, so I don't think so, not yet. And besides that, I don't think I got any more blue, <laughs> so I'm out of luck. Well, that's okay. I can just cut, cut the bottom off of there and put it up here, which I might do. Yeah. I have plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, now, let me push some of the white up there. Different tones of white. There's a soft gray, warm white, cool white. Interesting white. I don't know how I did that, but it was interesting. Get out of here, man. Now you can see, I'm using this white to pull the surface color up into the painting somehow. And I'm not sure if it's going to work yet, but I'm going to give it my best shot. It should be a shakaruni about here. It's a different temperature white, but it's white. So if it's within the same family, you can make a case. Or I could just cut the bottom of that and stick it up there. Yeah. But I thought this would be more interesting and a lot more of a problem. If it's more of a problem, then you're learning more. If it's not, you're not learning anything, but white works. Yeah. It also, where it hits the black, which is the highest contrast. So everything's about contrast. So if it's hitting the black, it's much sharper here, and it's quieting down the orange. If you notice, where that white hits, that orange starts to get a little quiet. Now watch what happens in this area here. If I can shoot it down in here without too much trouble. I gotta be careful here. Here we go. I'm going to put another one there, hope for the best. So you notice that this is starting to become, except for this area of the painting so far, is the quietest area. If you notice too, your eye didn't spend much time in here. It keeps going up. I can force the eye away from what I don't want. Of course, we can cut into that too. What the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Now, take this white, plant it in this area. See what happens. So the white now, everything is starting to get very quiet and very subtle. As the white hits it, that's what it does. I have big areas of white, like I got a painting that I got to fix, but because <laughs> it dripped. I hate drips, man. Now, I'm going to run this thing this way. Fix that other one later. Fix this one right away. I'm not letting everything compete. I'm keeping something smaller, keeping the mass larger as I move it further and further up the plane. 
We may cut into here just to move the color. Same thing you would do in a painting. You just paint it on, repeat it. Well, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, now. Let me do the, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Let me move this down, see if I can get some juice in there. There we go. Like somebody's three fingers up there. So now we have all these little pieces shifting, moving. We pull the mass back. In the case of this yellow, we're going to go to another yellow and shove that sucker right on top. See what happens. Now the guys who like the higher contrast will lay into that black and not have as much white because they want the action to be stronger. Some will want a quieter painting, so they'll use that white to calm down their overs, over action of the color. So each painter has their own creative necessity. In other words, I never tell you guys what's right or wrong. I just tell you what's working. Because your attitude is everything. The shape, what that shape is doing, all depends on whatever craziness the artist is involved with. <laughs> I saw something today that drove me a little nuts uh, going in the park. I spent a lot of time in the park. The park is a great inventor. Okay, here we go. And this may change the world as we know it. Who the hell knows? Yeah. I'm throwing these different tones of the same family to show you that you don't have to have the same exact color. You just have to have the family, warm and cool, working through the surface. The eye will pick it up. Sometimes you have fun with that and make the eye see things it doesn't want to. And that's more fun. You know. So now watch what happens when we explode into this red from up here. Okay. That's changing all these relationships. So the first thing I do is make adjustments. Hopefully. Simple shift. That whole mass shifts with that simple shift. You can do it with a stroke or with a gesture. You don't have to make a big deal about it. Same with the red. Bless its heart. Come over here. 
Now I'm going to pull the contrast back again as we play. I'm thinking process by process. I'm giving you a lot of information about color in process rather than just a single idea. Because you've already had that. In other words, I'm not big on color theory. I'm kind of like with Hoffman in that sense. Painters don't use it much. It's nice for words and it's interesting if you want to do a design on a wall. But in reality, when you're mixing paint, you have a whole different world. Color theory just doesn't fit. Okay. Now I've kind of established that in action without too much trouble. A little bit, but not too much. Let me slide that right down. Now, I'm going to, as the guy said, you know, I have blue here, blue there, so here's what we're going to do. Where's my knife? I had a knife when I came. Oh, here it is. I can move this blue around now. Okay, now, let me move this blue through here. It changes. You don't see that blue up there. It looks darker because the relationship of the red to it. Everything's optical about painting. You know, the pointillist had a good idea. The problem is that they've said, oh, this is the system, and it lasted about six months. There's no system. There's only techniques that you use in order to make the eye feel stronger as you're painting. You may want to use a little optical dots in a certain area to get a, get a jump. Oh, do I have a, a thing that push, no? Yeah, hole puncher. Yeah, hole punchers are, are really good, but if I don't have one, I'll just struggle. Now this blue on that blue it looks darker. It's not the same. Yeah. No, take a good look. It's darker. Get your nose in it. See? They're all different blues. That blue, this blue is lighter. That's a more violet blue. This is more blue blue. See? But then that's where I cut this from. Cut that from there. Doesn't work when I throw it on here. Optics. Okay, now we're going to start flying around here a little bit, making a different action. Hmm. So far, so good. That has to move. So, I will take this idea. <laughs> okay, I'll just cut it out. More than one way to skin a cat. I need some blue. That just pushes the flow across. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it gives you a little jolt. Okay. I'm on your little devil. Rise up, rise up. There we go.
Looks like some kind of wild animal got trapped in there. So the whole function is starting to move in that order. Then, as we're playing with this, doing this made this surface more active in relationship to the forms. In other words, they got rid of this rigid rectangle. So I'm going to do that in each one of these, see what happens, if anything. Because this is a stronger contrast than this. This is a stronger contrast than this. Mm -mm -mm. If I want an action to change in the painting, I have to change the contrast. Or I'm in trouble. Where did you go? Oh, here you are. Thank you. Now, I haven't made any form as interesting as the black form. Because I deliberately decided that that was going to be my struggle. That was going to be the battle I'm going to play with. The music is coming out of this mass instead of sounding back again. So with any luck, I'm leading you where I want you to go. Of course, I could be wrong, you know. Okay, now if you notice, there's a subtle quiet happening as we shift. The yellow is the dominant at the moment. So I have to either expand that yellow in here, so I'm going to do it this way. Show you the open form. don't want to destroy the action that I have, but I want it to have a little more strength before I put the black in, which is going to happen eventually. We go. Ah, 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 ah. Get excited. Now, of course, when I'm through it, is you guys can come up and cut a little piece off and frame it. Say, huh? just crop it. You know. They're not going to do it yet, but it will begin. Now the yellow is providing a shift, but I have to control the yellow 
by making sure it's a part of the red. I don't want the red to just disappear. I want it to be an interaction. So there's two ways of doing it. We'll do the simple way first and then put the complexity on top. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So now there's a lot of gibbly gibbly yada going on in there. So we have to stabilize it. I'm going to push it. Okay, so I'm pretty much stabilizing that, I think, so far. Put a little more red in there. No, no, I never put it on the canvas. All, all the actions I do here are to stimulate my sense of the palette and the sense of the large and the small. It also gives me a kind of a tint. How am I going to tint the beginning of my painting? In other words, I would never put four colors up there. <laughs> And, and separate it would be one color, right? But this is a demonstration. So I had to use four colors to give you the first experience of optics, of the color against the color and what it does. Then I slowly built it into the idea of a creative process. So I'm giving it to you process at a time. So you guys are getting a whole, say, three year work in about an hour. It's a gift. Yeah. But I would never paint from this. These would stimulate ideas, or I would say, boy, I went too far on that. I don't want to do that in my painting. Okay. Because this is cheaper. And I can frame it and sell it. Yeah. I mean, like Matisse. Yeah. No, I wouldn't do that. He did that because he got arthritis in his hands, couldn't paint. So he did cutouts. His cutouts were complete ideas like he was doing a painting. If I was going to do a cutout as a painting, I would do the same thing. I would simplify the whole thing. It'd be like two colors, that's it. One form, one solid form against the color plane and play with that. Yeah. So in other words, when people do something, it is, it's different from what they need. In other words, what you need is to understand what the color is going to do. Once you begin to understand that, then the action of those colors, you either say, no, I don't want to go in that direction. I want to keep more, all my colors cooler. So you, you make a decision according to the action of your work. But in, what makes it unified is that when you're done, you have a beautiful sense of the surface. That's what you're struggling with. Not just put a mark up there, but what is that mark in relationship to the whole? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know.
Okay, so now this area has enough action in relationship to the bottom, top, and the center that the first and the last one do. Even though this area is large, still larger, I think. I could be wrong, you know, I'm too close to it. But let me overlap that black because I keep seeing something. It's driving me a little crazy. Here we go. This area right here was driving me just a little nuts. I want to overlap that. Thank you very much. Keeping that black up. Black will sink on you really fast, so you have to be careful. The other thing you have to remember, if you use black, it stays black. You can't cover it. If you try to cover it in time, it comes back because it eats, it literally absorbs all the color over time. So you want that black form, you make damn sure that's what you want your painting to exist with. Okay, now let's make more of a shape out of the action of these in relationship to the overall idea. I'm trying to force the paper to be more interesting in the piece. So the big squares no longer serve a purpose for me. They, we've already done that. So now we're letting the action of the paper enter the idea of the painting and give it a little more interest. Plus it gives us more color. Uh -uh. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. No, I'm not going to do that. And now this one. Okay, now those three little panels are starting to make more sense in relationship to what's on top. Then we start to play. Come on, come on, come on. Up, 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 up. Thank you very much. Nasty little devil. So you can see, as color theory, this has gone a little further. Now established in an action of creativity. So you want that action all the time. That's why I'm not a big favor of just color theory. Color theory is nice to play with when you're looking at, say you have a palette of violet, blue and yellow and you lay out your palette to see what those colors are doing with each other but that's all it's good for once you've done that then you establish your painting one of those colors will be the dominant the other will be the accent 
มีเรนี่หลอกพูด from the bottom to the top 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 but everything is changing its position and its position over and under all the time so I'm always playing with that idea and whenever I spot it I make adjustment okay here we go hmm, that's interesting I'll be damned. I want to put something back there that's going to make a lot more fun out of this. A little action of neutral in that particular area of the painting is very important. Okay, pull the red square on top. Oh, there you go. There we go. Okay, now the wa the the paper is starting to take action within the surface as I cut away some of the sections and change the shape. I'm moving the white. I'm making the white a part of the piece, and I already have white on top, so I'm okay with that. That makes a, a shift theoretically. Let me do this, and then I'll take this mass and do something weird with it. Did okay? Where the hell was I? Oh, right. Okay, so now your travel time is even faster, I would think. In other words, painters will have you spend a certain amount of time as you're looking at the piece, your eyes doing all the work. So the optics is the primary concept to any piece of work. So you play with the, what you know works, expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Small pieces make broken colors that will help a light. This is a low contrast, but it controls the mass of that yellow. If you notice, it began to get a little smaller, but it had a lot of activity. But now it allowed this to grow, which moved into the bigger mass. So I'm constantly changing the action of the piece by just little pieces, not a big, massive. Also, by cutting, like if I had a palette, and I had these two colors, I would either do that or I would mix white in them, tin them down and play with them a little bit. So you're always thinking in those terms. You're thinking in terms of what am I getting, how much am I getting, and what is it doing for me, if anything. See, we're looking for information. And you guys that are accountants, painting isn't one, two, three. You just don't line them up. One, two, three. Do a red here, green here, everything's fine. Uh-uh. It's the relationship of the green to the red. It's the relationship of the position of the red to the green. And it's the relationship of the movement of the green to another position and a red to another position that makes a whole. 
That doesn't change. Now, when you paint, you don't think, you paint. I've told you guys this a hundred times. You do all your thinking before you work, and you do all your thinking after you work. But while you're working, you have to trust your hand and your eye. You're shifting it out. You move in form. If you fail, you rub it out and do another one. But you go back to your sketch and say, where did I go wrong? Pretty simple stuff. You don't try to make it rich in one tenth of a second. You let it happen, let your eye feel it, and then evolve. Then you got your painting. And each one of you are different painters. There's not the same painter in this whole room. Everybody's painting in a different concept, a different spatial sense, a different palette. That's the value of the class. That what you have in Unified is the principle of how it's put together. That doesn't change. That hasn't changed in thousands of years. First abstract painters, Chinese, 3,000 years ago. First abstract painters in Europe, about 1911, Kandinsky. So we're infants. We think still that the action is the abstraction, but the action is only the stimuli. The relationship of the parts is always the most important thing. Once you got that, it doesn't matter if you're painting flowers, Moses, uh, lemons, bottles, or a red streak. It's what is that red streak doing? How is it flowing through that form? That's what you're after. You're after that personalization of you in the way you approach that surface. And when you look at it, you look at its action and its movement. Like, let's say you could hear the, you could hear the painting. You're absolutely right. It starts to get very musical because of its tonality. Because I played and subdued it with paper. Kind of interesting. Now, all of these actions in here have become more stimulated. Now, I'll even do it a little better. I'll cut the corners of the top. Let me show you something. Once I change this action right here, if I can, I doubt if I can because it's glued. Hmm, doesn't want to move. Well, I'll be damned. Well, that ain't going to move. So what I'll do is I'll cut a piece of white paper <laughs> and I'll, I'll put it on top. Son of a gun. More than one way to skin a cat, I always say. Take the same shape. It's a little grayer, but that's okay. The idea that's important, not the exactness. I'll change that corner to become an action of the, of the lighter neutral coming in. A simple, a simple little adjustment here and there. Next thing you know, you got a piece of work. Okay, guys, I guess that'll do it. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I'm an abstractionist. I mean, as soon as I see something, I, I immediately pull it into an abstract form. I don't mess with it too much. I go right after it. Because as I get to the studio and I'm working on my work, I'm flipping through my sketch pad, seeing well, what the hell have I saw that day that I, will help me, stimulate me to solve a problem. So I will do that all the time. I will not, every once in a while I'll do a head or something, but I tend to, 99% of the time, I'm, I'm abstracting it. If I see Jim sitting on that stool, he becomes a rectangular shift in movement, which I may use, it may not. So it's what my eye picks up on, I make a note. And then I line them up. Like often, if you came in my studio, you'd see little sketches pinned up on the wall. So I'm playing with those things all the time. Because I, I'm st I have to stay stimulated. If I don't stay stimulated, the work begins to sink. It becomes a job. Artists should never be a job. It should be a joy. It's your soul you're playing with. 
You're not part of the commercial world. The commercial world is trying to figure a way to make money. That should be your second nature as a painter. You get the painting first and money later. What's that what I call excess baggage? You just have to deal with it. But you cannot join the commercial world and become anything of value. You just become a moment. Because watch the, watch the commercial world. Every two years. Painters, not necessarily. Good painter is a good painter. They stay. They bring substance. You never paint for the masses, ever. Because they don't care. Their big job is to feed themselves and pay the rent. That's it. Art is something they play with if they have the time. It is a few people in this world that have a strength, a sensitivity, and a mental need to see what you're doing because you help them. And that's what Hoffman gave us in that little book when he talked about the action being on a different position all the time. That you don't just line things up and then sign it. And don't work for a perfect painting, because there are none. All gone. Okay, guys. Thank you.